Um, I am seeing that it is now seven o'clock. So I think uh, given our tight schedule that we ought to go ahead and get started. Um, and hopefully some folks will continue to join us as we go. So first of all, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Hibbert and I'm the Acting Dean at the Faculty of Education and we are so delighted to welcome you to this virtual homecoming. Um, this has got to be a first and uh, I applaud you for taking time out of whatever you may be doing or not uh, from home this evening to, to join us. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We're going to ask each speaker on the panel to turn their video on while they're making their remarks and the rest of us will keep our video off. I'll come on when we're about a minute away from their time being up. Each panelist is going to speak for about 15 minutes. And if you look at the bottom center of your screen, you will notice a Q&A button. And that Q&A button will allow you to ask questions while the panelists are speaking. I will record and jot those questions down and then I will uh, invite you at the end of all of the speakers um, to invite you to, uh, to raise your question at that point. I should also mention that we are recording this session for um, uh, others to potentially view down the road. Well, it's now been an astounding 215 days since Western quickly transformed the way that we were working together to function largely in a virtual world. And while this was an incredibly difficult time across the university and all universities, um, the Faculty of Education found itself to be rather well positioned to manage these changes. In part because we've been offering fully online master's degrees and professional learning through our additional qualifications courses for the past 20 years. And over that time, we've grown in our own knowledge and in our online pedagogical practices and in our confidence using technology. So we already had in-house technological knowledge, learning design support, and we were able to help uh, mobilize our education instructors who signed up to volunteer in large numbers to help our colleagues across the university who were brand new to online teaching. Uh, as they had to make this shift in a very sh short few days. Our teacher candidates also began to offer virtual tutoring to students across the region. And we were able to support over 400 families between March and July. And then in July, we partnered with the London Community Foundation and our local boards to create an on-site practicum, which we piloted during the month of August. And Joanne's going to talk to you more about that program when she is up. But we also recognize that as a faculty who works with uh, 44 partner boards across the province of Ontario, it would be critically important to ensure that our own teacher candidates were well prepared to teach and support teachers and students in this new and constantly emerging context. And so we again partnered with our community to create onlineteachers.ca, which is a suite of micro credentials developed with the strong support of one of our own teacher candidates. And Matt's going to be sharing the exciting developments that uh, he has been making with this initiative. We recognize this has been a really difficult time for everyone, families, students, and instructors. Um, and realizing this, our own Tracy Sheepstra created a not-for-profit called Embodied Learning with 28 of our teacher candidates and she's going to be sharing some of the wonderful resources that they've created with you. We especially worry about our youth who were struggling before this pandemic. Karen Bax is going to describe how we've been able to continue to support children during these really challenging times for families. What we offer you today is a snapshot of some of the activities that the Faculty of Education has been engaged in over these 215 days. I could not be more proud of our community for pulling together to do what is best for our community. We have learned so much and we will continue to carry that learning into our post-COVID era whenever we get there. 
The panelists that we are fortunate enough to have with us tonight are representative of a group of people in our faculty who have put in countless hours to try to mitigate the effects of this global pandemic. I am so pleased to be able to introduce you to the work that they have been doing this far. So I would like to start off by introducing you to Matt Baisley. Matt Baisley is the Senior Director, Integrated Services and Office for Global Initiatives at Western Education. Matt. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to, the, to, this, to this talk and thanks for taking the time to join us. I'm just sharing a screen with you now in regards to uh, some of the work that uh, people in my unit are taking on. I want to talk to you a little bit about OnlineTeacher.ca. Uh, this project was initiated because we found that candidates were quite nervous about going on virtual practicum, as Kathy had said, uh, where they're not doing uh, teaching in the normal way that they would be, that they would be expected to. Um, one of the predictors is you teach according to how you were taught and unfortunately these, these, uh, these teacher candidates are now being thrown into quite a uh, challenging situation because they are now having to do their practicum uh, virtually. So we created a, a, a site, uh, micro-credentials as Kathy said, called onlineteacher.ca and we did it with some intentions. Uh, we wanted to build out resources, but we also didn't want resources to be created and have nobody access them. So we wanted to, uh, them to be useful. Uh, one of, that was one of our design principles. Uh, we also wanted to, to be provide a sense of calm um, and connection to the university. So the connection would be where teacher candidates and practitioners come together to discuss current challenges given the virtual environment and current opportunities. Uh, we also wanted to um, generate calmness, but also a sense of excitement. The, the, uh, this has been an opportunity for teacher candidates to be able to um, experiment. It's a, it's, a, it's a creative space right now. Um, necessity is the motherhood of invention, as they say. It's also a place where uh, we want students to experiment as well. So we took on the role of creating uh, a bit of calm, a bit of uh, excitement towards this. The other design principle that we wanted to use was, was we wanted to be holistic. Um, the design of this particular micro-credential is focused on um, what the teacher would typically experience in the school. Uh, we've seen now that parents are much bigger stakeholders in the education process. In fact, they would be partners for a lot of the younger students. Uh, they are helping to navigate through the learning management system. Uh, they are going into their backyard to look for leaves for their kindergarten project that they need to photograph and upload to for the teacher to see. Um, they're the ones who are going to be helping through with some of the math problems. So we also wanted to be holistic and recognize all of the folks that are involved in that child's education. And as I said, we also wanted to ensure that we were, we were, we were building something of use. So online teacher is behind it is we have a lot of analytics driving it so we can see who is consuming what information when they're consuming it where they're coming from how they're consuming it what device they're using that's incredibly important and I think this is shows a bright future for uh, learning because we now know what the students and teacher candidates are now seeing as being incredibly important that's informing our next generation of online teacher.ca it's also informing some of the things as who we're picking to be guest speakers in the uh, in our seminar spe our speaker seminar series. I'll give you one example is that we know that uh, a lot of student uh, teacher candidates are concerned about students who are anxious in online environments and that's a valid concern. So we knew that they were visiting that particular micro credential quite a lot. We knew that through our data uh, of what the the information that was being consumed in online teacher.ca. So we quickly reached out to Dr. Colin King, uh, one of our faculty members of cognitive education, who um, thankfully so uh, offered to do a talk for an hour about uh, how to work with anxious uh, students and uh, build in student success strategy in a virtual environment. 
So the data was really important to us because what we're finding out is, for example, students are fairly comfortable clicking through an LMS. That's not really their concern. They're more concerned with how to deal with parents. They're concerned with how to deal with at-risk students. They're more concerned with ensuring that they are measuring up, which is, uh, hold, you know, puts our teacher candidates in good stead because they are extremely conscientious in how they're going about this. The online teacher.ca uh, is also front facing, uh, which means that anybody can get into the site and look around and consume the information. And what we're finding out is that uh, we have way more um, people navigating through the micro credentials than, we, than our teacher candidates. So we have 600 teacher creden uh, candidates enrolled at the Faculty of Education, but our, regist our registrants are well over a thousand which tells us that there's more people who are finding you, this content useful. The other piece of this is, is that we're inviting in practitioners from the different school boards to come and speak to our students in a way that, um, in our speaker series. And what the, the benefit of that is, it's helping the uh, traditional classroom teacher co-create with the teacher candidates. They're sharing things that they've just recently uncovered, which I think is, uh, really neat it really kind of showed models how education should be where you are experimenting and 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 failing and learning from your failures so we've had a number of uh practitioners who have thrown into this online environment who if you asked them last year probably would not have you know would not have thought of themselves online teachers are engaging with our teacher candidates and doing talks but during those talks we're finding that people are coming in from other school boards now so it's now building a bit of a community. That was a, a positive unintended consequence of online teacher.ca. So where are we now with, with this site? Um, as I was saying, uh, as we're preparing for this talk, I hope we will continue on with the good learnings of what we're finding out about online learning in the K to 12 space, the kindergarten to grade 12 space, because we're, we're, we've crossed abyss, we've crossed a gap now where uh, we now are in a creative space where people can now experiment, and I hope that can use on. We have a thousand registrants in online teacher.ca. We're hosting these sessions with faculty members and practitioners, which leads me to where we're going with this. Um, I think what, what we're seeing is, first of all, micro credentials are becoming a part of the post secondary landscape, it's becoming more and more popular. The fact that this is a site that is readily available at any time for somebody to access would suggest to me that it, we're kind of supporting a just-in-time learning kind of uh, piece of it. I have been contacted from uh, a school system in Brazil who would like to use this, and I've said there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be using this. This is an open, we are a publicly funded institution and we're open to people. We're delighted to have people using the content and, and looking at different ways of doing it, and in fact, it would be very useful useful for us to have Brazilian educators coming in to speak with our Canadian counterparts and vice versa. So we're starting to see a bit of an international attraction to this particular micro-credential. So we built it with intention to be front-facing. People can come in as, a, as need be, uh, consume the content that they think is relevant to them, and then from there uh, decide if they want to attend the seminar series or not. And in some cases, uh, actually host a seminar series. So we're hopeful. This is a a, a wonderful project. I've seen some incredible things. Uh, uh, I've worked very closely with one of our B.Ed. students who has really brought in a youthful vigor to this and has really been amazing in developing some of this content. And uh, I see this as being a positive way for teacher education. And with that, I will stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. <clears throat> um, I, I think that uh, if any have, have joined us since Matt started talking, I'll just remind you that there is a question and answer section in the lower center of your screen. And as you are listening to the panelists, if you've got some questions, uh, feel free to post them in that space. And uh, we will come back to those questions at the end and have a, a more fulsome discussion about what all of this means for us uh, post COVID for education going forward or specific questions that you may have in terms of uh, the program. So it is my pleasure now to introduce you to Joanne Lombardi. Um, Joanne has just joined us uh, August the 5th 
as our practicum and community engagement coordinator. And I have to tell you that on her very first day of work, I met her at the community practicum <laughs> placement site. And when, when you hear the expression, hit the ground running, that was Joanne. So Joanne, I look forward to uh, listening to what you've got to share about the updates. Thanks, Kathy. Let me just get uh, my screen ready here, folks. That's awesome. So yeah, so as Kathy says, I am the, there we go. Are we on? Let's see. There we go. Uh, as Kathy says, I'm the community and uh, practicum and community engagement coordinator for the Faculty of Education. And, and thank you so much for joining us here tonight, folks. Um, it was a great start to this uh, opportunity to work for the faculty to just jump right into this project which I fondly refer to throughout the summer as teaching in a tent and I know it's a little bit colloquial but um, that's really what was going on in August in South London and it was a really amazing endeavor so I'm going to share a little bit about that with you. This was a project that started before I arrived and uh, a lot of work went into it long before I appeared on the scene in August. Um, but there were four um, uh, very important uh, groups within London that came together to support this really uh, cool initiative for youth and children in South London. The London Community Foundation was central to this and in particular their COVID Response Fund Advisory Council. They partnered with the South London Neighbourhood Resource Centre. Some of you may be familiar with them. They work extensively in South London. London and Middlesex Community Housing was a key partner and then uh, the Faculty of Education came on board. And all of that was wrapped up with an amazing grant of $50,000 that came from the COVID Response Fund Council. And that money was put to extremely good use this summer supporting um, children and youth in South London. They started out having conversations with um, educators in London when the schools were shut down in March, um, very concerned about the impact that um, missing out on educational opportunities would have on children, and especially those who are already marginalized um, by various you know, events happening in their life. So this committee was struck with members, representative members from all of those groups, and they determined um, that they wanted to put together a pilot project to see what kinds of supports they could bring to the children and youth in South London and, uh, and, and see what they could do. Here was their goal, which initially focused on, if you'll see at the bottom there, expert tutoring. But as it turned out, as things began to morph and develop, they determined that um, it was going to become more than tutoring and they really were hoping to run um, classrooms, if you will, in August to get these children back into um, educational mode. They had been out of school since March and it wasn't always clear what kinds of engagement and involvement they had once the schools shut down for numerous reasons, too many for me to go into here. But it was determined that um, it would become a bit more of a classroom uh, look than a tutoring look. The project um, took off like wildfire and uh, had many, many others involved over and above those four partner agencies. Western was able to recruit 11 teacher candidates. These were uh, teacher candidates who were completing year one and who at that point had missed out on their second practicum, which was supposed to have happened in the spring and it did not. So 11 teacher candidates stepped forward to say, count me in. We then um, recruited four experienced teachers to help support those teacher candidates in their, practice, in their placement. They hired an on-site supervisor who was key to connecting the teacher candidates with the community um, members and in particular the children and youth. I was involved as the practicum coordinator. The advisory council um, always ranged between 10 or 12 people that met on a weekly basis to problem solve and provide some guidance and direction back to the on-site supervisor. We were very grateful to rely on educational publishers 
who um, kindly donated um, some resources or loaned us some resources. We, we gave most of them back, but to support this because we really were building classrooms and a school under a tent. So it was, it was bare bones at the beginning. Our teacher candidates were supported as well. We were so grateful to have the support of Dr. Susan Roger from the Faculty of Ed and Paula Jesty from MI Understanding, who both gave Zoom um, presentations to the teacher candidates to help them better understand the population of children that they would be serving and just to speak even in general about mental illness and mental wellness in children and youth which we know has been a significant concern to all of us in education as COVID has continued and carried on. So um, they, they became part of our external team, if you will. We put out a call to friends who um, hopefully had books to donate and I drove around Southwestern Ontario picking up books and other people dropped off books. So we um, had many um, books, children's books and uh, young adult books for our children to use. And Goodwill Industries also stepped up and provided a lot of donated um, books as well. So as you can see, it really became a, um, a team approach. It was definitely um, a community affair. And I think what was so neat was at the end of the program, I had some feedback from all of the teacher candidates and many of them commented, and here's just one quote, they commented that they were aware of the fact that this was a community approach, that it wasn't just them and children and you know me and their teacher associate looking over their shoulder. They were very well aware that this was built from the ground um, because of the dedication and desire of many people to make this program work. And, and here's just a few of the community members, not our teacher candidates, but people from the, uh, the committee and our, our on-site coordinator. This is Preet, our on-site coordinator, um, there every day uh, for five weeks to greet the children and the teacher candidates. We absolutely followed strict um, COVID protocols. So at morning, everybody would um, be temperature checked. They would have to complete the COVID survey. They also had temperature checks and uh, at the end before they left the tent. So even though we were teaching in an open air environment, we absolutely adhered to that. Masks were required for all children and anybody um, a grade four and up who was entering the tent. We wanted to get the children used to what school might be like in September, knowing that that was coming. Prior to the program beginning, Preet as on-site coordinator did a remarkable job and this was so key to the success of the program. She canvassed the community. This is the South London community housing area on Southdale Road. There's approximately 200 families living there, um, about 100 and, oh, sorry, about 172 families with 200 children. And initially she had gathered um, about 73 families or children were interested in attending. She walked around, knocked on doors, explained what would be happening in August on site and uh, you know, tried to convince them to sign up their children. Uh, 73 children were initially interested. By the time the project began, we always had anywhere between 25 and 35 children regularly attending, um, but it was a great beginning. Um, we were excited with their enthusiasm and Preet, knowing the community, knowing the families, um, she did an amazing job. Um, before the project began uh, under the tent, our teacher candidates actually went out and did a door knock as well. So we now had names of children who would be participating. The teacher candidates knocked on the door introduced themselves as the teacher and said, you know, come to the tent next week, I'm your teacher. And what an amazing and unique opportunity for teacher candidates to have to, to teach and meet the children in their home environment. That was one of the most amazing parts of this experience. And, and they fed that uh, to me at the end when they reflected on it. it. It was really an amazing part of the project. So here's the tent, as you can see, it's open air. Every day the um, classroom had to be built and uh, at the end of the day it had to be dismantled. I will suggest that the teachers in the middle of the day got off easy because they didn't have to lug out the tables and chairs nor return the tables and chairs. There was a, um, a storage um, container on site that everything was stored in that got locked up at the end of the day and the next day we would begin again building the classroom. We would set up three different learning environments under the tent um, each of our sessions, there were three sessions throughout the day. Each session had um, three teachers 
and children were distributed among those three teachers for their learning. Um, as you can imagine, there were outside challenges. There were um, bikes going by, there was garbage pickup day, there were ambulances careening down Southdale Road, and, and children actually would leave the tent to return home if they needed a washroom break. And I remember when a teacher candidate saying to me, never did she ever imagine that she would see a child walk back into class after um, a washroom break with a plate of pancakes. So um, the teachers certainly learned to be creative and flexible with whatever came their way in this outside environment. They maximized the um, space as much as they could. The photo on the left, actually, they were doing a math lesson there. They were calculating angles and arcs. That was with our secondary group. And um, they, the teachers really had to think fast on their feet. They had a roster of children who they were hoping and expecting to show up every day, but it was variable for many reasons. Um, the afternoon group was the um, hardest group to entice children to come. They were um, for the grade seven to 11. And there were some days where we had more teachers than students on site at the beginning, but we, uh, we overcame that. The, uh, the organizing committee that met weekly problem solved their way around that. They knew that incentives worked and gift cards became a great motivator to get the, uh, the high school children there or students there, I should say. They were given uh, you know, McDonald's cards or Tim Horton cards and, and families were even um, thanked with um, Kind, with cards of, um, you know, don't, um, gift cards, if you will, as the program evolved, just to thank them for sending their children. Um, the community um, organizers who work with these families on a regular basis recognize the value of that. So we built that into the program and that certainly improved our attendance. Just a, a couple other pictures of some of the things to, to expect. As I said, there were three sessions, the morning session, the first session was primary, always between about 10 and 15 children. The middle of the morning would have been the junior group, again, between 10 and 15 children regularly showing up, uh, a lunch break, and then the afternoon session of teenagers. There was sanitizing that went on in between each session, table wipe down, chair wipe down, and of course, you know, masks were in place. At the end of the program, um, I did gather feedback from both the teacher candidates and the um, children. And the teacher candidates were really overwhelmed with this experience. It was tough. It was a really tough experience. It was very rigorous. We knew that it was, we wanted it to count as a practicum experience for them. And our practicum placements have to follow strict, um, you know, protocol and guidelines as outlined by the Ontario College of Teachers. So it was really important that we maintain the integrity of our practicum, even though it was in the summer under a tent with a varying group of children that showed up every day. But we asked our teacher candidates to still prepare lesson plans, to still deliver actual lessons, to provide student feedback. It was not camp, and it was not side-by-side -side homework, help, or tutoring. It was, it was lesson planning and lesson delivering. And it was rigorous. Um, our four associate teachers who supported them were Zooming with them almost daily, or certainly emailing with them daily, to support the development of, of good, solid lesson planning, to execute and implement those lesson plans, to reflect on how their lessons went and then to start again the next day. So um, it, it was a tough, it was a tough gig. I think none of us really knew what to expect going into it. I said many times we were building the ship, but it had already left the harbor. And, uh, but, but we, we settled in and the teacher candidates rose to the occasion with the support of their associates and the community at large. And as you can see by their quotes, they absolutely um, really saw the merit and value, not only for themselves, but more importantly for the children and youth they targeted. Um, they certainly were hoping to see this project carry on as is the COVID response committee um, through the London Community Foundation and the steering committee from the partner agencies. And um, we've continued to meet, the project ended just prior to Labor Day, but the, the committee has continued to meet on a weekly basis to reflect on the summer project and to see where do we go from here. It's critical that the vulnerable in our community do not just have the sit and get or the one and done. And that was always an imperative for this committee long before I even joined them, was that there would be some longevity and sustainability. And I'm thrilled to say that just this week, 
uh, the London Community Foundation has come uh, has ex approved our grant proposal has come forward with um, a significant amount of money which is very exciting so that the South London community um, group can once again have programming um, this time it will look a little bit different obviously it's running through the school year children are back in school for the most part um, we will pre offer this to our teacher candidates not as a practicum anymore but as an alternate field experience whereby we look for their commitment on Saturdays from October till May, where they can show up. We now have two locations. The Optimist Club of South London has four portables that they have prepared for us to go into to do some teaching. There is um, some space right on site at Southdale Housing Complex for the younger children to meet teachers. So there will be opportunities for Saturday, um, what we're calling enhanced educational learning. It's also going to be supported with midweek tutoring and also opportunities for families to be given a meal, to gather obviously in COVID safe, you know, um, you know, restricted environment, but they'll come, they'll get a meal. The families will be given some resources on how to support their children with their learning with an onward goal of really getting the children in this specific community excited about learning, engaged, motivated, um, to see themselves as learners and, and to take hold of that with the support of many. And, and there is a larger goal that this project will extend to other areas in London. So it's, um, it's been nothing but a positive um, learning experience, um, not for me, but more importantly for the children and the families in that group. So um, kudos to, to Western for jumping on board and, and uh, grabbing this opportunity to partner with these local agencies in London and these, these forward thinking people. And I think there's great things still to come out of this project. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, it's been quite interesting to watch this project evolve. And like you, I am really excited about what the next phase of it will look like. Um, we have been in talks um, with uh, our government representatives as well to see whether this may be one of those things that we can continue post COVID and see whether there are opportunities to provide some programming during the summer that uh, could fit into our program. This is one of the perhaps um, unintended consequences of having to um, shift in, in a pandemic and do things a little bit differently. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Tracy Sheepstra. Tracy is uh, one of our part-time instructors. She's an assistant professor in the Bachelor of Ed program and she's also the CEO and co-founder of Embodied Learnings. So Tracy, I look forward to hearing about this. Thank you. Project. Well, it is a pleasure to be a part of this event this evening. I'm really excited to talk about embodied learnings and what it is that we have done. Um, before I get into talking about the way we built community during COVID, I should go back and give a little bit of information um, that just gives you an idea of how it is that we got here. So. I have been a dance education and movement specialist for close to three decades and I've taught in a variety of educational environments. Um, I've taught in elementary schools and private studios as well as different university um, platforms. So in different teacher education uh, places. So within York University, OISE and of course at Western. And one thing that became very apparent in all these years that I've been teaching is that teachers really lack the knowledge and skills of how to bring dance education and integrate movement into the curriculum. Even though we know that there are great benefits of doing this, it's something that just has not really taken hold. Part of it is that there really is a lack of support and resources available for teachers. And we often think of movement as just part of the arts, something that is categorically different than many of the other subjects like science and math. And so even though I've been doing this research and this work for years, it really hasn't been changing much within education. 
where things started to change, which was very exciting, was when we moved from a one-year Bachelor of Education program into a two-year. And for the first time, dance started to finally have a place within the curriculum. And I was really fortunate to get hired when the first curriculum and pedagogy in dance and drama um, for elementary education got started. So I designed the program and started to teach it. And that was a really great opportunity to make impact with the students in that program. And at the very beginning of every term, I would take a survey and I would ask them, what is your experience of either dance education or movement integration into the classroom? What have you seen? How do you feel about being in your body? And at the beginning of the course, what I would get is a lot of students letting me know that they were incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, they were uncomfortable because they either had little to no experience with movement integration or dance. They had really not seen anything within their practicum. Um, they were uncomfortable in front of their peers and so forth. And by the end of the term, we would do this survey again and we would see something very different. Teacher candidates who suddenly realized that this was something that actually was a lot more accessible than they realized. They were having a lot of fun. They were really recognizing the benefits of being in their bodies for themselves, especially these really long days in the faculty where they were sitting for hours on end and they would come into my class and suddenly we would be in their bodies learning and doing. So I decided a year ago that I would do a, an alternative field experience and I put it out there to see if anyone would be interested in working with me to create a dance resource website. And I had five very enthusiastic students and we worked together for a month and we created some really interesting resources. But when it was all done, I thought, I think this needs to be more. I think this really would do better as a not-for-profit where I could really advocate for the importance of bringing the body into the, into the elementary classroom as well as into the curriculum. Ways that we could really integrate sort of that movement with the various subjects that we are teaching. And so at the time I spoke with my daughter, who is a singer, songwriter, musician, and also uh, was working at the time as a financial advisor for a major bank. And I asked if she would come on board and do the operations, if I would do the front sort of education, creative communication end. And she said, absolutely. And so we founded our non-for-profit in September of 2019, and we immediately created a board of directors of which three are certified Ontario teachers. And we started the process, um, but as things are, life is very busy. And we, I kind of knew that I was going to wait until the spring and to really sort of ramp things up. And so in January, I put out another call for an alternative field experience. And we had a really big um, response from teacher candidates who had been in my class. Uh, they were year twos, really excited to get on board. And so we had everything set up. I had this vision in my mind of what we were going to create together, sort of the vision of where Embodied Learnings was going to go. And of course, as you can imagine, we found ourselves in the middle of a pandemic. And everything that I sort of thought um, was important and where I thought we could would go really twisted on its head in a moment's notice. So it was at that point that I had to really think, what is it that is most important here? One, I have a number of students that want to be a part of, um, of this experience and they need to to graduate. We also found out that there were a number of year one students that were looking for placements. They could not be in practicum and so they needed um, something to do instead. And so we kind of opened our doors wide and said we are here to create a community with teacher candidates who want to work with us and we welcome you. And in the end, um, at this point, we've actually worked with 24 teacher candidates. Uh, we started with 17 and then it just continued to grow. We decided that what was most important is that we needed to put our students first. We really needed to put their mental health and well being before anything else. And so we set up a structure where we let them know we are here for you so that you can succeed. We want you to learn. We want you to be a part of our project and help us to grow. 
but at the same time, we really want to make sure that um, you are also taking really good care of yourself. And suddenly this idea of bringing the body into the classroom and the curriculum was how do we really bring the body into embodied learnings, into this alternative field experience in the ways that we could work together. And so we did daily check-ins. We had um, whole group meetings. We had small group meetings, individual meetings. And we talked a lot about how are you caring for your physical well-being, your mental well-being, your emotional well-being. Are you making sure that you are getting up and are moving away from your computer at various times in the day so that you can take a break? Are you getting out in nature so that you can breathe fresh air and going for a walk? How is it that you are able to maintain or gather the energy to do this work? We noticed that a lot of the teacher candidates that we were working with were struggling with motivation. Um, some of them were really worried about loved ones. They had to separate from parents who were more vulnerable. They had to, um, they were in different cities from partners. They were, um, again, trying to manage teaching and also having children at home, not teaching, sorry, being part of the alternative field experience. So there were a lot of things that were happening and we found that how we were thinking about where we wanted to go with embodied learnings suddenly was changing in the sense that uh, we knew that there was going to be a lot more online, of course. Now um, students were at home working online. We knew that we wouldn't be able to do the work of going into the classrooms. And so we started talking about what are other possibilities and having so many really enthusiastic, young and creative minds working with us made a really big difference in terms of how it is that we could not only support each other, but then go beyond how do we want to support teachers? How do we want to support future teacher candidates and teachers um, with what could be a very new way of being in the world of teaching? And so we started to create uh, resources. Uh, they created these beautiful resources that could be used in the classroom, that could be used online. Um, we started thinking about what kind of blogs and topics what might we write about? Um, what are all the ways that we could sort of get our message out? And really at the end of it, we realized that dance education and movement integration was the vehicle, but what it was that we were really attending to was the mental health and wellness of each other and those that we were reaching in our broader community. I want to share with you the vision and the mission that really evolved and developed as our non for profit did. So I'm going to just share my screen. So here is um, the vision. So I have to just move this. Um, so our vision is to create thriving classrooms where students spend more time moving and less time sitting so the whole body can be engaged in the process of learning. And of course, that can be um, in schools that can also be online. Our mission is to provide teachers, teacher candidates, dance specialists, mental health leads, and other support staff with the knowledge and skills necessary to educate students from the inside out, where the body is a gateway to a deeper understanding of self, others, and the world. We advocate for the inclusion of the body through dance education and movement integration in the elementary classroom. It is our mission to bring awareness of the impact embodied experiences can have on student learning, healthy relationships, student wellness, and an inclusive and welcoming learning community to create thriving school cultures. So the bulk of the students that we worked with were with us for four weeks. And we had a lovely sort of meeting at the end to really get feedback and to find out where they were. And the one thing that they said that really made the difference um, for being able to do this alternative field experience was the feeling of community that we really did pull together and it made doing this work, they were already excited about the work, but knowing that sort of this virus, this, you know, pandemic was there, um, being able to focus on something really helped them to get up every day and feel like they were on purpose 
But the fact that we talk so much about mental health and wellness and that we were talking about the body and, and researching and creating resources about the body really made that difference for them within their own and that they were sleeping better and taking better care of themselves and just being that much more aware of, of sort of the impact of our own bodies and how that is in our own ability to thrive and that they would take that with them into their future teaching, whether that again be in schools or whether that be online, however it is that they would be teaching in the future. Now at this stage, we did finally launch, um, officially launched with um, a uh, website. And I just want to um, pull that up really quickly to show you. We actually had a teacher candidate who created this for us. Um, I'm just so delighted that she was able to uh, make this beautiful website for us. And I'll just quickly scroll down here. Um, so she did all of this and we have so many different things you can learn about who we are, um, leadership, our board of directors and all the students that have contributed. Uh, what we offer. So we are offering all kinds of wonderful things that just keeps building and the new students that come on and work with us as part of the AFE are all contributing in many ways to these pieces. So we have uh, something called Body Talk where um, I interview experts in their field um, every week. We have again a lot of amazing resources and the students that are coming and doing um, some of the work with us have been really tying in the body to a emotions. Uh, we've been doing some work around trauma. Um, we've also been doing some really interesting things around communication and again different ways in which to explore outside in nature um, and that just because of social distancing again there are no limitations to how it is that we can be in our bodies and still build community within our schools. We offer an amazing playlists, we have activity demos, um, and then we have uh, a, a regular blog as well. And then of course, different ways you can get involved with us. So all of this big, this big project and all these things are here really um, got started in April. And again, it just is now sort of has a life of its own. So that is how I have kept busy. Um, I just wanna say one more thing that I'm really excited about is because of the work that I did and because of the connection I've had with these students and them sharing their own personal stories with me, their challenges, their fears, um, just being very real through the experience, it has made me so much more cognizant of how I'm going to teach my dance and drama course this fall. Embodied Learnings will be a resource that I will offer to students, but I realize that first and foremost, their mental health and wellness is always first of mind. And I wanna make sure that they get in their bodies so that they can have fun and be engaged and be well. And I'm hoping that what we translate in the course to learn about these subjects is also very much about creating this beautiful personal experience of wellness for them. So anyway, that's a little bit about us. Um, if you are interested in learning more, of course, you can visit our website at embodiedlearnings.com. And again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I actually took the opportunity while I was listening to you to stand up and move. It's been quite a long, a long day in this chair and uh, you always inspire me to do that. I somehow feel like, it, you know, I need to pay more attention. Um, Thank you. So our last speaker, certainly not the least, is Dr. Karen Bax. And Karen is the director of the Mary J. Wright Center um, and Research and Education Center. I'm sorry, I need to pay more attention to my uh, <laughs> titles. Um, I'm giving you the short form. Um, and Karen's going to talk to us about uh, what, what happened there and how the uh, pandemic shifted the way that they were able to support families. But the bottom line is they continued to support families. Karen. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as part of this homecoming event um, to hear and to hear about the innovative ways my colleagues at the Faculty of Education have so quickly worked to build community um, dur during COVID. It's really inspiring and we don't get an opportunity often to hear how uh, what each other are doing. So it's really uh, wonderful. 
I'm just going to share my screen with you. There we go. Everybody can see that okay? Oops. Oh, just one minute here. It's not shared yet, Karen. Oh, it's not, okay. I have two screens, so sometimes it's... Um... There you go. Looks like okay. it's good. there it is. Excellent, great. Um, I'm going to just move it over to the screen with the camera. Okay. Um, so I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of a, a background about myself. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Ed, but um, I direct a uh, research um, and education center that's actually in Marymount. So that's sort of the context of which I'll be talking to you about um, in terms of the things that uh, we have been working on um, in the past few months. It's no doubt that um, children and families have um, struggled in the last while, although um, COVID hasn't really affected children's bodies so much, uh, thankfully, it certainly has begun to affect their minds in terms of increased anxiety um, and mental health distress um, and, and parents as well. And so as part of what um, we've done through the Mary J. Wright Center is uh, work to better support those who support children, um, and that is working with parents and um, with educators. So in the next short while, I'd like to just begin by um, providing you a bit of a context for the work that we've done in the last few months. Um, one of those is in supporting parents, um, and as you can see on the screen, um, that is a screenshot of the Mary J. Wright website where we have a number of resources created um, already very early on in early April for families around COVID. Um, we've also worked to support families through providing um, urgent psychological services to families at Marymount who were really having trouble um, coping with COVID, having children home, not being at work and those types of things. And then also how we've supported educators by creating a uh, one hour webinar on um, trauma informed uh, teaching. So the context is that Western Mary J. Wright Research and Education Center is a community university partnership between the Faculty of Education and Marymount. The picture that you see is a rendering of uh, our office and it's pretty exact when you walk in the front doors of Marymount Children's Center for those of you, those of you who know it. Um, our office is straight ahead. And um, this is a really neat partnership because it's not one where university is going in and doing research or teaching and then leaving. We're very permanently there and committed to a uh, partnership with the community and with children and families and supporting them. Uh, the university does this, or sorry, our center does this in three ways, which will be important for you to understand in terms of what we did. One is supporting uh, community research in early child development and family well-being. One is by um, really strongly supporting how quick um, research uh, that um, could help families get to those families or the community. Um, rather than it taking quite a long time as traditionally. And the last is in um, supporting and teaching the next generation of professionals, um, primarily psychology students, um, in a, a real world setting, which is Marymount. So in the past, past five years, we've had over 175 families participate in research. We've been involved in 15 studies and early child development. Um, we provided over 100, and it's actually 170 families um, with psychological support. And we have um, had 36 PhD students in school and applied psychology from the Faculty of Education come through there to do their psychology practicum. 
So with that context, um, how did we and what did we do to support those who support children and youth? One of the ways in which we did that was um, typically our, my PhD students who do their practicum have to do a plain language summary um, for parents uh, around different topics of, of child mental health. And in March, when the pandemic started, um, I told them that they could no longer choose their own topic. And what I thought would be wonderful is if they created some um, for families in terms of understanding COVID. And I must admit, they went beyond um, what I thought they would do. They did a really fantastic job. And you can find them on our website, which is at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so the first one was about how to talk to your children about COVID. They wrote this lovely little a note at the top of their uh, resource or their brochure um, for parents. Um, but inside what it uh, really had was frequently asked questions um, by kids about COVID and how to answer them. Um, the do's and don'ts of talking about COVID-19 with children. Um, and how to talk to kids for, uh, at different ages, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence. And then also um, other tidbits, for example, on how to explain social distancing um, to children uh, and to adolescents. Uh, this, is, this was a very, very popular pamphlet early on, uh, especially, um, I think, because we got it out very early and um, we were also uh, in part of our collaboration with Marymount. Marymount received a grant to provide um, kits for uh, vulnerable families for things that their children could do um, during uh, COVID and while being at home. And as part of those kits, all of those families um, received a printed copy of these three brochures that the students completed. The next one um, that they created was Keep Calm During COVID-19 for Parents. And um, this was uh, a uh, resource particularly for parents um, and how to help them remain calm and um, keep their well-being so that they could um, help uh, their child and um, be there for them. And so they had uh, nine different steps and uh, there's one here, model optimism, um, with resources that came with it to uh, continue uh, looking into ways to model that for your children. Another one was um, remembering to just con continue to connect with friends and family, even virtually, and um, setting up a pattern of how to do that. Um, the last brochure or a resource that was created was supporting children during the coronavirus crisis. And um, this re resource had a really a great number of things and um, it really talked about um, kind of how to uh, continue to exercise and how important that is to mental health for children and what parents can do. Just simple activities and where they can find resources on the web, um, how to keep routines um, and uh, keep children in the loop of what's going on in the world, but keep it simple um, and helping children feel in control in different ways because really COVID has been an experience where we all um, feel like things are out of our control um, quite a bit. And so, you know, how could children help to feel a bit more in control? Um, and then uh, they also for adolescents and, and parents um, had some information about how to determine if the news is fake or not fake around COVID and then um, uh, reputable news sources and where families can go to find um, uh, up to date and, um, uh, and scientifically based information and accurate information about um, about COVID uh, on the go. Um, our, these resources were really well received. I've had a number of people ask if they could put them on their websites um, and um, they continue to be looked at even now, which is really great. A second way that we um, supported uh, families during COVID was as part of the uh, practicum experience, the psychology students that work with me see clients of Marymount for psychological services assessment or intervention. 
And so um, because we could no longer see clients um, in person, what we did was we very quickly, I very quickly learned all the ins and outs and safe ways um, and legislation around providing psychological services online and then um, taught that to the students. And we set up an urgent COVID psychological referral um, with Marymount. And through those, that referral, we um, saw about 15 families. And um, they were really just families who were in the moment not coping very well for various reasons, often multiple reasons. Um, but some of the main reasons that we um, had these referrals were really all around COVID and um, were uh, related to anxiety of parents, um, anxiety of children or children who were already anxious, becoming even more anxious and not doing well. Um, children being lonely, sad, not able to um, see their regular friends and family. Um, the stress around homeschooling for um, parents and children. Um, and children who had experienced loss or parents who had experienced loss where this kind of loss of control in their world had, had created a re-experiencing of loss. So we were able to continue our practicum and um, help families uh, during that time. Um, and I think the students learned a lot from that. The last way in which we um, transitioned quickly to support those who support uh, children was um, in creating a webinar in teaching in a trauma-informed way. I had previously, um, I had previously done a lot of teaching and um, work with uh, children and families who've experienced trauma. And in one of my previous research projects, um, I had uh, created a trauma-informed training for educators. And so um, I was asked by um, PHE Canada, which is physical and um, physical, it's not education. I forget right now. Oh, I health was, education. Thank you. Health. Thank you. Right. Health, because also part of what their health is, is social emotional health. So they had reached out and, uh, and had heard about this and asked if I would create one, but specifically have some slides in there around when children come back from COVID or from school in September um, amidst the pandemic, what new things might we see that we should be in tune to in terms of triggers for kids and things like that, and how can we help them? And so um, uh, I had about 50, 150 um, educators across Canada attend that, and then we were asked to also provide it to the London District Catholic School Board. Um, the mental health lead, Sandra Savage, wanted to make it available to all her educators on their intranet. And so uh, I worked with her and she did a pre, um, uh, preamble around it, encouraging her educa the educators to um, take the time to look at that and, um, and then it was made available for them. And so I just have a couple of slides you know, around the types of things that um, were in this webinar. Um, but really, I see, you know, a trauma sensitive teaching um, really is about resilience building, how to be resilient in the face of stress, difficulties and adversity. Um, and so part of that is learning about the brain and how the brain reacts under stress, which is often an aha moment for parents and educators. Um, and, but then also we talked quite a bit around um, not only traditional, I shouldn't say traditional stressors related to various trauma children might experience, but those that might, um, children might have experienced in the past six months prior to coming back to school and what that would look like. Um, and, um, whoops, and some of those triggers that might occur at school that would bring them back to feeling very unsafe or anxious. Um, such as germs or people saying don't touch that and, and anxious children being very scared um, about being told that or just that feeling of loss of control, uh, for example. 
Um, and then lastly, the um, webinar talked about, um, about 15 different ways and how to help children uh, self-regulate um, when they are feeling very stressed and some classroom self-regulation ideas um, as well. So those are the three ways in which we transitioned very quickly at our um, Community Research and uh, Education Center at Marymount to be able to support um, children and um, children through their families and educators because um, you know education takes three it's the parents the teacher and the student um, and this is the name of the names of the students that I worked with this year who were uh, helped create um, the pamphlets and uh, ran the urgent psychological um, clinic with me. And that's all. Feel free to contact me if you want any more information. And uh, it's been a pleasure sharing this with you. Thank you very much. So while um, we are waiting for uh, some of our guests to uh, ask any questions that they may have through the question and answer uh, icon at the bottom of the middle of your screen. I am going to um, invite our panelists to put their images back up, their video turned back on, and I'm going to lead us in a couple of questions to get the discussion started. And I will keep monitoring the question and answer period in case uh, <coughs> someone in, that's in attendance has something that they would like to ask. But I'll get us started. Um, Although I knew all of the topics that were coming tonight, uh, I certainly hadn't heard each individual person talk about the things that they've been doing. And I found it very interesting. I found that um, each of you talked about the need to be nimble and adaptive in the moment, mm -hmm. something that Toffler warned us about 50 years ago, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, and while this presented significant challenges, I sense that it provided a real opportunity for each of you to think about doing things differently. And so I wondered, what do you think that you were able in, in the context of what you've described, what were you able to achieve given the necessary flexibility that we were afforded, required during this pandemic that you hope will continue? I can, so, an I can answer that. Sure, my Karen, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, I think traditionally psychology has been um, chair to chair and you know, family or child and um, the therapist. And that is not always very um, family friendly uh, for families who have trouble uh, getting places, um, for example, transportation uh, and things like that. And maybe it isn't always necessary as we previously thought. Um, there can be some easier ways to support families, particularly families who have a lot of adversity and it is a huge struggle to make appointments. Um, and so I think a little more flexibility that way um, would be a great thing to hang on to. Okay, thank you. Tracy, do you have something to add? Hmm. When it comes to uh, dance education or any kind of movement type of work, we, it's always been something that I've done in person uh, mm -hmm. where I've done it with um, you know, a group of people where we could really work together collaboratively. And to do this differently online has really had made me shift my thinking that getting into our bodies and moving can be done in multiple ways. And we can do it um, on our own. We can do it through a screen by just really thinking much more creatively. Um, how we do it may be different, but there's always possibilities. I think the big thing is that there's possibilities to, to any problem if we really just get into that sort of solution mindset. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I, I've always been somebody that loved to move, but, but thinking about it through all of what we did with the students has heightened it to a level that may never have been there before. Mm -hmm. My ability to think outside the box, and as I'm walking through nature, I will think, 
oh my goodness, I can totally turn this into an activity and I know how I could teach it to a, to a teacher or a parent and they could do it with their child and you could do it on your own and it would be amazing. So I think that's, and I've never had to do that before because there wasn't a need. So um, I'm really grateful actually for the opportunity to stretch my mind and also the teachers I've worked with where they've been able to do the same and we've come up with some pretty brilliant things. Who knew you'd be using words like grateful for opportunities during a pandemic? Yes. Matt. Uh, my gratitude comes with, um, I've been deep by watching my teenage daughters engage through technology um, and also working with some of the B ed students as well as some of the undergraduate students and developing these micro credentials. We've done other projects for the university as well. And what, what I'm seeing is that they are using um, technology in very meaningful ways, in ways that, and I love technology, but we're seeing a, a, a next level tech, use technology. So we're seeing collaboration happen at 1.30 in the morning when they're both kind of working on a math problem. Um, it really does broaden out the concepts of what is learning, where, where does learning happen? Because uh, for these students that are coming up, um, this, this is not a place that's defined by walls and bricks and mortar. This is a place that is very much in the, in the, in the internet, in the digital space. And so it's caused me to rethink a lot of my pedagogical assumptions. And it's also uh, been delightful to watch these young minds um, really expand on how they learn, how they collaborate, how they cooperate. Mm -hmm. And it's a real call to action for our educators, our, our, our teacher candidates as well as practitioners, in how they are going to manage afterwards. Because I think we've unleashed something here that the genie's is out of the bottle and we're not putting it back in. And that, there's a lot of good things to that. So we need to rethink where does learning happen for the most part. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matt. Joanne. Yeah, a, a couple things. I, as Matt was talking, it made me reflect on the fact that we were teaching under the tent without any technology, and there's Matt, you know, technology to the nth degree. And then I'll back it up to Tracy. She used a word that I loved about uh, learning about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to wrap all that up with a couple other P words because I'm a big fan of Michael Fullen. And, um, and I think the experience in the tent brought me back to his whole concept of the three P's. So precision, personalization, and personal learning. And I think for our teacher candidates who could knock on doors and see children in their home environment, th that just really spoke to me about sort of that groundedness of good teaching. And um, with or without technology, right, we've, we can still look for those possibilities and no matter what COVID or anything else is going to throw our way, bring it back to some key points. So that was my thought. Thanks for that, Joanne. Um, this discussion has led into um, something else that I was thinking about as, as you were all talking. And um, I mean, it's something that we have paid attention to, to before and in other ways, but it's really come across in this moment. And that is, community, um, and also working with our own students to inform what it is that we're doing in terms of building our programs. And, and uh, it, it just made me wonder how we can better position students and community to be more actively engaged in our, our program renewal and our thinking and our development as, as um, part of a normal process rather than you know, getting feedback and surveys after the fact or um, jumping in and requiring them in at a time like this. So I'm curious about your thoughts about uh, how, how we might do a better job of that post COVID. Who'd like to begin? That's the million dollar question. Um, because one thing I'm mindful of, I mean, listening to these amazing things that I wasn't very familiar with either, it really spoke to me about community and getting the message out and getting the word out and building on that excitement and enthusiasm and sharing the good news, if you will. But then I'm very mindful that we're also in times where there's information overload 
and how can we best manage our communication strategies? And, and even today, Kathy, at our, our team meeting with Anna, we talked a lot about that, how to streamline our communications because the emails are going rapidly, right? So I don't have an answer, but I do think that this needs to be shared and shouted from the mountaintops because it provides a real holistic view of, of valuable, meaningful learning opportunities for our teacher candidates and then ultimately the students that they're working with. So I don't have any answers. I think to me, the big question mark is all around the, the communication of it so that it, it, that it sticks and it doesn't just become something else on, in the inbox. So I don't have an answer. I only have a question. Matt and then Tracy. Kath, that's a great question. Um, the one thing that I think post COVID that we want to hold on to is, um, and this goes to Joanne's point of sending emails out and are you, are, is, it, is it really of use to anybody? Um, what, what I'm seeing now with a lot of the digital infrastructure is that we're able to uh, understand in real time who, where, when, how stuff is being consumed. And I think that the university traditionally has been a very kind of walled off place. It's been the ivory tower, so to speak. This opens up opportunity for us to get real time statistics and evidence of what kind of impact are we having. Um, it's one thing to build a website and we know uh, that happens all the time. It's another thing to build something of use to people. So at times we get enamored with our own ideas, our own approaches, our own thinking. I mean, my goodness, I have to share my thinking, my opinions with other people because they're just so good. But what I'm finding is that what I thought was important to teacher candidates is important. And by virtue of asking them or, or looking at consumption patterns, I'm learning uh, there's a, there was a, a deep concern about how do I work with parents? And I didn't know that when we built the online teacher. I thought we we're going to be building a tech site of, well, this is how you do an LMS and all kinds of things like that. There was a deeper concern there around the human side of things. And we had to address that. Um, so I think post-COVID, I hope the university and I hope we as practitioners and And you have frozen that. Faculty <laughs> members are going to be using these opportunities to inform our own practice. Matt, if you can hear me, I'm going to pause you because you're um, unfortunately breaking up and, and uh, we're not able to hear you. You've frozen a few times. So I'm going to agree with you. Um, we, we've done some work in the uh, teacher ed office that also demonstrated that real desire to learn more about working with parents um, in meaningful ways, not just reporting out. And, uh, uh, and so we, we initiated a course last year. It's an elective, but uh, it's been well subscribed and continues this year that um, brings parents into classrooms with our teacher candidates to work these issues out together. Tracy. Uh, when you were speaking, uh, when we were talking about community and connecting with students, the first thing, the words that came to mind was community circle. Mm -hmm. And I've done lots and lots of work over the years with different types of circles, but it made me think of the mentoring groups that we have mm -hmm. and how last year I ran two mentoring um, uh, groups and we always came together and I created a circle and the first thing we did before we talked about sort of how they showed evidence of their own learning, the ways they were documenting, um, you know, evidence they were collecting in practicum, things like that is how are you, how are you doing, how are you feeling and really getting a sense every single time we got together with um, just where they were in the program, how they were managing, again, in terms of their own mental health and wellness. Um, and there was so much that they revealed. And so I just think that that is a really great place because they are small groups, they get to know each other, um, where community is already being built. And I think that it's a, a place where the, the master teacher mentors could facilitate that being a place where you learn more. I learned so much about my students and what they really wanted to know, where they, what they really wanted to work on or where they really felt they weren't getting, you know, the, the, the meat. Um, and that was 
incredibly valuable for me to see that. So I think that's a great opportunity. And we can do that in Zoom this year as well. Yeah. You know, in terms yes. of how I think that's been a nice addition. And, you yeah. know, just to follow up on what I think Matt was talking about there when he was cutting out, um, you know, we, we have this interesting situation in, you know, become, being teachers who know how important it is to understand our students, who they are, where they're at, um, in order to design appropriate curriculum for them. We know that when we go into classrooms. When you work within an institution, you have to create that year-long syllabus in advance of even meeting your students. Mm. And that syllabus is, is like a bit of a contract. And so we have a proposal that we're working on this year with our teacher ed design group where we are trying to bring our students in in a more active role. We're going to have a student advisory committee, for example. The uh, master teacher mentor groups that you mentioned for our guests who may not know much about that, um, that was initiated last year uh, as a way to bring students together across their different divisions. So whether they're in primary, junior, intermediate, or senior, they meet um, every uh, twice a month uh, all year long for two years with one mentor and it's an opportunity for them to create what we call a professional practice record and to share um, their learning journey as they work towards developing the competencies that are expected by the College of Teachers. Um, so they're really rich opportunities to discuss not, not just the brass tacks of meeting competencies, but um, the process of how, how we are supporting them to be able to um, develop those competencies. And, and like Matt has said, we, we are interested in it for its um, opportunity to bring that feedback to us in a timely way so that we can actually respond and address uh, what they may feel um, they still need more of or uh, things that are working well and things that aren't working so well. And I can tell you that, you know, as we entered this virtual um, Practic or practicum and virtual classrooms in a teacher education program for the first time this year, we immediately heard from some students, despite our, our best intentions to prepare our instructors, that um, some of the courses were still feeling very overwhelming in terms of the way that they were designed and that we really had to rethink that design. When you imagine the learner sitting in a format like this, facing a screen for eight to 11 classes, right? And then the necessary group work or workload that goes along with still working at a screen in order to get those tasks done. And so it's evolving. And despite, as I opened with our expertise in doing online learning, the kind of online learning that we were doing was um, designed for working professionals. It was designed for folks to, who were already uh, had experience in classrooms to sort of come in and, and learn how to uh, de further develop their, their practice. Um, this is a different group of students. This is a group of students who have not been in classrooms before other than as students and have to make this huge shift from student to professional. Um, so it, it's been something that we have um, been really doing a lot of thinking about this year and we've got some exciting ideas. I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious of the fact that I have not seen any um, questions come in from our uh, attendees. Now that could be because you don't have questions, or it could be that there is something going on with um, the question and an answer uh, tool itself. Um, but I thought I might just give the last couple of minutes to our panelists to see if any of you were moved to um, consider a question that's come out of this discussion or that you would like to mo know more about. We've only got about six or seven more minutes. Matt. So I moved to a new place in the house, so I think I'm in a better Wi-Fi zone, <laughs> but you never really know. 
Okay, so I'm in a better zone of something or other. Um, the one thing that I'm, I'm, I am interested in, um, in learning more about is, um, you know, for something that Tracy is, is, is doing, um, you know, what, what does the future hold in, in um, so my daughter did um, an online class in phys ed last year, and she really had took responsibility, she's a very studious student, so she took responsibility. What do we see as a future for that where, uh, you know, uh, a student maybe have a, um, can't come to school or doesn't have access to that? Um, will the pedagogy evolve so that uh, students can engage in phys ed or dance in a remote way? Mm, that's a really good question. You know, it's interesting. I've been speaking a lot with my colleague, uh, Norma McMillan, who teaches health and phys ed here at Western as well. Um, she does the elementary um, course. And how even though we're both offering something that's movement based, it's, it's quite different in how we do it. Um, the challenge for something that's in physical education is often that you require equipment that there's a lot of social games that involve people being together um, so that they can play off each other. Mm -hmm. And she's still grappling with the best way in which she can um, do that really effectively. For her trying to teach teacher candidates, she's using a lot of videos. But in terms of doing the work with students, I think it really comes down to having to always think about what is most accessible. Um, so, because there's lots of things that students won't have access to in terms of, you know, like if it's being done online, they won't have access to certain equipment yeah. or doing things with others. With what I do, it's different because you can do a lot of movement on your own or, again, with somebody else on the other side of the screen. You don't necessarily need equipment or need the same kind of room. But ultimately, I think it comes down to how do we instill this um, connection to the body? How do we help um, children find a way to, to, to feel a love for actually moving, stepping away from their computer or their phones, getting up and in a more timely fashion? So what are tools that they can have that that, that support that? Um, do they need to put on music and just dance on their own? Do they need to think of, okay, what do I have that is fun? Can I be creative and, and, and come up with a game on my own? Is there somebody in my family that I can do this with? So I think it really, I think it's going to take time to, to create sort of those new possibilities, um, especially if we're thinking through the lens of equity and inclusion. Uh, that's really the, the, the most challenging aspect of this is that we're working with a really diverse group of students um, in terms of what do they need to have to, to create these options? Where do they live? Are they in an apartment? Do they have a backyard? Um, is there, it's, right, there's all of these things that we have to consider, um, which I think will, will take some time. But I like the idea of, of just starting with, let's connect to our body, have a body awareness. What does it feel like to be in our body and to do the simplest things so that we realize that we can create energy by moving. And it's so good for our mental health and wellness. And it really does support and learning and engagement. And we can cr create fun and we can kind of go from there. I hope that helps, but yeah. that's sort of what I was thinking. Can I, can I add a comment to that, Kathy? You can uh, add a comment. Oh, okay, great. Uh, you know, I, so, so I'm, I'm, getting, I'm going on my daughter's example of she is not the most physical person. Um, right. and, and she, she was on a, a, a modified program. What I found was uh, the teacher did a great job of allowing her to practice more yoga as opposed to some of the traditional things I've done. And there wasn't anybody in the basement doing it with her. And so she felt quite at ease and she quite, she quite enjoyed it. So I would argue in some ways, this has created a more equitable place for those who are not as physical as others. And so, but I, I, I take the point of making sure they have the resources so they yes. have their own basement. So that makes okay. sense. Uh -huh. and, and I was just going to say that this year with my students, what I think may actually happen by us being in our own homes is that they may actually get up and dance more freely because nobody's watching. And I've been thinking a lot about the, sort of their own use of space and their own comfort level because they are in a sense in the privacy of their own home. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for that point. 
Well, thank you all very much for um, the time that you have committed on top of all of the time that you've committed over the last 215 days um, to come and serve as panelists. Um, I'd also like to thank Na Natalie Devereaux from Western Alumni and Rosie Treibner, who is our um, Director of Community Engagement and Development at the faculty. Um, she's been in the background um, working away at getting this sorted out. There's Natalie. Um, but more importantly, I would like to uh, thank those of you who joined us tonight. As I said at the beginning, this is probably a first, um, a virtual homecoming. It's not quite the um, the large gathering that we're typically accustomed to seeing at homecoming, but we're so, so happy that you joined us. And uh, I just want to thank you again for coming out and learning a little bit more about what's been going on um, as we've all made this uh, massive and uh, quick pivot um, to doing things differently in the eye of a pandemic. So thank you and I hope you have a good evening and enjoy the rest of the homecoming activities. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, that was really good. Yeah, I don't know whether, um, I see we still have some attendees. I'm just not yeah. sure whether the um, Q&A might have been it was activated and I checked okay. it a couple of times too. I'm thinking maybe people were just shy with the questions, right? So, all right. But I'm going to, I have the record, so we will send it out to everyone that registered. So, if for whatever reason they couldn't join, they will still get the link. So, Lovely. well, have a great night. Happy right. homecoming and best wishes. Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.